Okay, so welcome. My name's Carolyn and we're here to talk for two hours this afternoon about the women of Troy, which um, obviously for you, you have chosen this for Section A. Is that accurate with everybody? If you write in the chat, just let me know. Is everybody 100% sure they're going to write on this in Section A? Okay, Jack, what are you throwing it up against? What are you thinking of? What's the other text? Oh, golden age. Um, have a look at last year's examiner's report and just compare how students scored in the golden age versus women of Troy. And if you're really still sitting on the fence, use that statistic to decide which way to go um, and see which text could possibly give you, of course, you've got to write well on them, but could possibly give you the best marks. Does that make sense? This is a great text to write on though. Yeah, good. So just go VCAA English Assessors Report 20, um, 20 and the very bottom page of their assessors report, they give you statistics of what um, each text scored and it's a good guide if you're unsure. Okay, throughout this whole um, lecture, at any time, just write into the chat any questions you have, any contributions you'd like to make, any additions, anything you're not sure of, make sure you pop it into that chat and I'll try and answer it um, virtually straight away because I get you're going to keep getting inside of my head I get a little uh, red dot that tells me that somebody's asked something. Of course, in two hours, we can't possibly cover absolutely every little detail of the text. But what I plan to do is go through um, what I consider sort of um, quite key points and, and um, quotes that I've used with students um, when we've written essays to to give you, um, I guess, just to reinforce the concepts that you already know and to reinforce your own knowledge. So we'll use that as our base if that's okay with you. And if at any point you don't understand, please, as I said, just throw something into the chat. Okay, first things first, I, I won't go necessarily through page by page of the text. I'll definitely be using, has everybody got this version of the Women of Choi? Just because when I call out page numbers, okay, I haven't got any no's yet. So fingers crossed that when I call out a page number, then it'll be easy for you. Have this sitting next to you. If you don't have it, go and quickly race and get it now um, because I'll use this um, a lot. I'm going to go through all my tabs and, and the reasons why I've got them highlighted and we'll go through the, the text together that way. Okay, listen, it's a Euripides, it's Greek mythology. You have to have some basic knowledge and some understanding of um, the references in this text. So you're going to get references to say to Aphrodite, um, you'll get references to um, Odysseus and characters who don't have any spoken um, role in this play. But it's important that you understand you know the role of these people either prior to the text or the dramatic irony that occurs when um, a character like Cassandra in particular gives us an insight, you know, she's damning everybody and saying this is what's going to happen to you in the future. It's important to understand what actually does happen in the future. So, for example, um, in my off the top of my head, I'm referencing, um, remember that Agamemnon um, took control of Cassandra, so she became his slave. And she, remember, she comes in in the episode and she's, she celebrates it and um, Hecuba thinks she's gone, na, na, boom. And... Um, and she says, in the end, she says, no, 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 I'm happy about this because, you know, he will be killed and so on and so forth. And, of course, exact, that is exactly what happens. Agamemnon's wife ends up killing both of them, but she celebrates that fact. And, and because of that, that's dramatic irony. If you're looking for meta language in the text, that's what we call dramatic irony. And so it's important that for some of these characters, and I'll, I'll make a little bit of a list for you as we go, that if you don't know and if, um, if you're unsure, that you do go and look up some of these characters and, and their fates um, once they're taken to Greece. Um, remembering, of course, is anybody by any chance for the comparative doing the Penelopead? Is anyone doing that pairing, the Penelopead and Photograph 51? That's good. So maybe your schools didn't saturate you in um, Greek mythology. Has anyone studied Ransom last year? Um, Maloof's Ransom? Yes, no? No. Oh, Ebony, you're doing it this year. Okay, so... Um, with the ransom, of course, you'll be you'll get you'll get a little bit of pre well not a little bit you get a lot of Priam in it, and of course Priam was Hecuba's husband, so it gives you and there are a few lines in Ransom about Hecuba, um, Fatima, good same. So this is good. So you're going to get some knowledge. Listen, I'm going to give you 
a show to watch. It's probably bad timing. Um, but it's a Netflix series and it's called um, Troy, Fall of a City. Now, you can probably stream it on one of the, on a site. The reason for this is it gives really good context. If you're still struggling at this point to understand Greek mythology and this whole story of the Trojan War, it actually goes literally from the opening scene in it is when um, Athena, Athena and Hera and um, Aphrodite open up with the whole conversation about um, or the whole, the whole um, competition about the golden apple of discord. And that's really important background information. I'll go through it with you as well. But it just gives you a visual. It gives you something to look at. It's a little mini, it's a little mini TV series. I think there might be eight or nine episodes. And it goes literally through from the, the reason for the Trojan War, you know, with Helen uh, running away um, with Paris and then Menelaus, you know, seeking revenge, um, vengeance and so on and so forth, all the way from there um, right through to, um, I guess, where the beginning of this text would kick in. So it's just a good background um, piece. But regardless, I just want to make sure that everyone's clear with the background of this text before we zoom into it. Because if you don't know it, you're not going to write as well, okay? That's what it basically comes down to. You want to be writing as, as well as you possibly can. So, of course, we're in, um, in the world where gods reign supreme. They were quite important and mortals were mortals. The important part for this text is the knowledge of, um, we'll call it the competition, the golden apple of discord. Did you cover this in class at school? Just let me know, yes or no. Good, Zara, that's good. Anyone? Okay, Brie, this is good. A little, Blair, okay, good. So, Brie, this might help you un, um, advance your knowledge. Um, for, for everybody else that's got answering, this will just reinforce and remind you how important this is. So we had the goddess of Athene, Hera, who's the goddess. Sorry, I'm just looking at my notes so I don't stuff up who they are. Fertility. And then, of course, Aphrodite. So we've got these three goddesses who've decided that they're going to have this competition and they want to be granted, it's almost like a, out of the Disney, out of a Disney tale, they want to be granted as the fairest of them all. In fact, you know, who is the most beautiful, beautiful god, goddess? Is it Athene? Is it Hera? Is it Aphrodite? You're going to see a common theme throughout this whole um, text with, with war and the competitive nature of the gods and indeed um, all, 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 the, all the notable heroes that we come across in, in these types of plays on, on, on um, Greek mythology. So what they do is these women have decided, okay, I want to decide, I want to be, um, I'm going to use the word crown for want of a better word, crowned the fairest. And, of course, the fairest in this instance does not mean necessarily justice. It's really about beauty, okay? They're quite vain. So they speak to Paris and they say to Paris, um, you've got to decide, it's up to you to decide who is the fairest of us all. And each of the women, each of the goddesses, so Athene says, I can't even remember now, but she might say, I'm going to give you, it's in the play, I'll need to, I'll find the quote for you, I'm going to give you the, the strongest army and you'll... Um, you'll always beat the Greeks and Hera offers something else. But Aphrodite is our winner because Aphrodite offers him Helen, the most beautiful mortal in the, in the world, the most beautiful woman. And Aphrodite says, listen, if you, if you grant me this crown, if you tell me that I'm the fairest of them all, then I'll let you, mar you, know, I'll, I'll let you marry, um, have Helen. I know she's with Menelaus, but you can have Helen. And, of course, Paris chooses that. Hence Helen coming across, being 
kidnapped, if you believe her version, but coming across with Paris to Troy. Okay, that's how she got there. Now, the, 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 whole, the whole world of the gods in, in, um, from our understanding or our interpretation is that, well, Athene and Hera were pretty annoyed then that they didn't have, they weren't granted the crown. Okay, so they were angry. Because they were angry, they sided with their powers, they sided with the Greeks because that's their way. It's like nasty little girl games. That's their way of getting back at Paris. They said, oh, well, bugger you. You chose her, so be it. But now we're going to side with the Greeks and we're going to make you, we're going to come after you. And, of course, what happens is they support the Greek, the Greeks and the Greeks come through then. Remember, Paris takes Helen. This enrages Menelaus, the king, and that triggers a war. of um, 10 years, over te oh, definitely 10 years, triggers a war and then they off to fight the Trojans, of which Paris was one, to get back Helen, to take back Helen. And, of course, that's what, that's part of the reason why in that scene, and we'll get to it, in the episode where um, Menelaus comes in, we've got Menelaus, Helen, and we've got Hecuba, and Helen and Hecuba are given that opportunity to um, defend their behaviour and, and why they should or shouldn't um, be taken and so on and so forth or who is and who isn't responsible. We get in that episode references to Aphrodite. We get in, in that episode um, references to... Uh, well, not only in that episode, but right throughout the play, particularly from Hecuba, Helen stands as um, a Greek figure who is often talked in a really nasty, in a really bitchy way for one of a, for, that's the best way to put it. The women were really bitchy about Helen um, and blamed her for the downfall of Troy. And, um, and, and so uh, I guess she was cast as almost an outsider because of her beauty. Um, because she was able to seduce any man she wanted, okay? So there was um, all that behind the scenes. This is important, okay? So that background, that knowledge is really, really important to, to getting this text. The other thing that um, you need to know is remember the Trojan horse. And the Trojan horse was what let, and you'll see that, I and mean, you can look up the Trojan horse in, in many films, as many films with it. Um, the Trojan horse was designed by the Greeks. It fooled Troy, the Trojans. And that's what allowed them into the citadel. And um, it, once, once night fell, that's inside the horse, remember, all the Greek soldiers were, and they came out, and that's what allowed them to um, destroy destroy Troy. Does that make sense? Does everybody understand that part? I know it's kind of weird. 